Welcome to this podcast is making me thirsty. The number one destination for Seinfeld fans. This episode 59, our guest today is a writer, producer, and actor. She has been professional acting since she was five years old in hundreds of productions on stage, film, and television, including King of Queens, Will and Grace, The Tonight Show. She created the acclaimed series, Don on the Go. And of course, she was in over a dozen episodes of Seinfeld from 1992 through 1998. We are super excited to talk with her today. Please welcome Peggy Lane. Peggy, thank you for joining us. Hi, guys. Thanks so much for having me. Peggy, welcome to the show. And actually, Tony just mentioned it that you started acting at five. I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, and I don't trust IMDb, but let's, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's go back in time a little bit. I know 1991, you're on one of my favorite shows, Hunter, with Fred Dreyer. I love That's true. that. That's true. Um, so then a year later, you know, you're you're on the suicide 1992 with Seinfeld. Tell us a little bit about how the whole opportunity with Seinfeld came about. It's it's really interesting because uh, Hunter and Seinfeld overlapped at the time. I was working as a stand in on the show Hunter and on the typical summer hiatus, which is usually three or four months. I did a TV movie and I met a couple of ADs. That liked me and they wanted to bring me on Seinfeld that next season but I had Hunter. <laughs> Hunter for me was five days a week like 12 hours a day it was a lot of money and multi-camera sitcoms like Seinfeld for stand-ins are like three days and they're shorter days mercifully but again it's you know like half the pay and I'd already committed to Hunter and I didn't want to be this person that just jumped around so I couldn't do it I couldn't do it and then when Hunter ended I got a call the following year 91 to be on Seinfeld again which was insane because when in life do you get a second chance at something right, you know right, especially right. something that turns out to be Seinfeld you know <laughs> and I mean I couldn't believe it they apparently they didn't they weren't happy with who they had or whatever so the offer came my way again and and thank God, because it changed my life. And so you were, you were originally, you were the, you were a stand-in for Elaine? Yes. Yeah. Talk, talk us through a little bit of what that, what that looks like from someone that doesn't mm. maybe not know what it's like on a set. Like, oh, sure. It's, like, it's almost akin to what in theater is an understudy, except that you never really get to go on. You know, you <laughs> go on for rehearsals, but obviously you can't be on in the show. But for rehearsals, for camera blocking, for lighting, you are, you know, standing in for Julia. So if your camera blocking the little kicks or whatever, that would be me. If Julia's sick or she needed to be with her child or something, I would rehearse for her, which was, it was just fantastic, you know? I mean, it's, it's, I had studied acting for years and I learned more through stand in work with working with people at the top of their game than I felt I ever learned in acting class. So, you so uh, you were so you were full time stand in from ninety two to ninety eight for Julia. Yes. All right, and then and then you sprinkled in some acting, and I'm assuming you probably yeah. took part in a lot of things on on the set. No, I mean, did yes. you? Because you are by trade, you know, producer or writer. Uh, yeah. Did you? Were you in kind of any of the writing rooms while any of these episodes? No, I. I no, I wish I had been, but that's actually where I got the desire to be a writer, was working on Seinfeld. Prior to that, I was just, you know, I want to be an actor and, and being on a show three days a week or whatever, it gave you a lot of time to audition and go out for things or do a play on weekends. So it wasn't like your whole life was just this exhausting 60, 70 hour week. So it worked great for that. Um, what I did learn on Seinfeld is I helped, I helped the AD department. A lot. So I would like do the paperwork, the skins, the breakdowns of, you know, how people get paid. I would block the background in the coffee shop. So I would learn and I would watch the monitors and make sure that everything matched. And I figured out very quickly how easy it was to do that. Because now if you watch, <laughs> you will see like the opening shot of the coffee shot, you'll see a master and you'll see one or two people cross. The rest of the time, mostly people are sitting and right. the boots behind them. And then it's only like when Kramer enters that you need a cross to show that there's other people. So it was very simple. I had also learned from being on other shows as a waitress that you don't need to carry a lot of food around because food makes noise. 
food spills, coffee cups, you know, utensils, they all make noise. So now when you watch the show, notice in the coffee shop that they're mostly just taking orders because that's quiet. <laughs> and that was intentional. That makes sense. And I do notice that they're always, they're always leaning in or pointing. That's to right. And I always tell, yeah, yeah, always yeah. Like, lean in there and get in there. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Um, so it sounds to me like, um, like it was a, like a master class in everything about being on set. I mean, you're learning how to act. You're not obviously you're, you're, you're honing your hair up to acting, right, you're right. picking up on writing, you're doing stuff directing wise. I mean, that yeah. must've been like basically a master's class. It was awesome. I mean, it, it is what you make it. You know, I mean, there's a lot of people that have jobs on sets and, and they, they sleep or they eat or, you know, they're reading the paper or they're, or they're bitching and moaning or whatever. And I was like, look at where I am. I know where I am. <laughs> you know, how do I get to here myself? Like, I'm just on the outskirts of this. How do I move further into this? <laughs> so what can I learn? You know, I learned so much working on that show. And do you, so... And you were there in 92, right? I mean, so 92 yeah. was season three. Yes. P possibly my favorite season, maybe season five. It's debatable. Um, yeah. and, we'll, and we'll get into that in a minute. For sure. Yeah. I want to want to get your take. But okay. so when you, you got brought in as a stand-in, mm -hmm. like, is there a tryout, an interview, or how does that work? And then how do you, how do you make the shift? to try and for some of these like i know they're small roles but those like right, right. you have to pitch yourself to like hirschfeld like how does how that how that come about um well let's see uh well i'll, I'll go with the last question first because yeah. it's it's the easiest and um because you're standing in you're doing the run-throughs there's on uh, slideshow shot on a tuesday so their week would begin on a wednesday with a table read and they would maybe do like a wardrobe fitting or something and maybe rehearse a little bit. I and the other standards would come in on Thursday, which is the day they would really rehearse the script and see if there were any changes from the network. You'd probably get a blue script by now. And you would rehearse that for the writers. It was considered a producer's run through. So you're going to producers, which is what you do in casting. So they are seeing you. So... Uh, the very first line that I got on the show was the suicide. You were right. And I had done it in the run-through. And after the run-through, Tom Sharonis, the director at the time, said, if that line is still in there on Monday, it's yours. I thought, okay. <laughs> you know, I've been very auditioning cool. for shows and for you know a long, long time. And you never, no one ever says that to you. So I go home on the weekend. I light my St. Jude candle. I pray. You know, <laughs> I get there early on Monday. I look at page 54 and it's still in there. Like, well, we'll see, maybe things change. But no, I did in fact have it. And it was a process that was, it's like the carpool lane of casting. Because you're there, because you're there, they have the opportunity to see you. Because on the other side of that, if you go through casting with an agent, they'll read 12 people for that one line. I've been one of those 12 people that reads right, for one right. line. And everybody's qualified. Yeah, everybody's got tons of credits. They're all talented. You know, it's, you don't always get those. You know, it's very hard to get those. So it was a real blessing to, to have that. So what, what, that, that's, I mean, that's, I love hearing stories like that, where it's like, you know, yeah. you got yourself in the position to where you need, you need to be You're in front of the right people. And then, uh, you know, like you said, mm -hmm. lucky or not, I mean, you were there and, and they, they, they pulled you, you know, for these spots when they when they saw that you were right. ready for it. What was your um, I mean, like we just said, you were there for such a long run. Now, we're we're huge yeah. fans. You know, Howard mentioned seasons three and five. It's a toss up and obviously four. But yeah. we kind of think the show goes goes in a different direction after you mentioned Tom Sharon's as the director. Yes. I mean, we're you're huge fans of his and um, mm -hmm. you know, we can see the tone shift after he leaves and especially yes. after Larry David leaves, obviously. Right. What, um, what was that like for you being on the set throughout that entire time? I mean, was that change palpable? Could you see a difference? I mean, oh, not, good, not better, absolutely. Just, what was the difference? Maybe you could talk about. Absolutely. Sort of, the sort biggest change like. well, for me personally was I had come in through the ADs that worked with Tom Sharonis. So when Tom Sharonis left, they left with him. And then you don't know, like, well, do I have to go to, you know, <laughs> because that's a lot of times what, what will happen. Right. If the director of photography leaves, usually the camera crew goes with them because he, you know, he got them hired. So if he leaves, you usually go with the people that brought you on. 
So yeah, I was happy for Tom. Tom got um, an amazing deal. They actually made the change after he'd already signed. So he got his full year salary basically to go and he still got to work on other shows. So, I mean, it really worked out well for him. And um, I found that Andy Ackerman was coming in with different ADs that I didn't know. We were like, mm, I don't know, you know, and they were, they were nice enough to go, no, no, keep the people you have, but you don't know that. But what you know, was, you're like sweating it out. Right. <laughs> and listen, Ackerman came with a great resume, resume, yes. no doubt, but. Yes. The, the, the Sharona is like, did, did something happen like at, from higher up? Was there like some conflict with Jerry and Larry? Like, what, was there a reason? What was the reason he left the show? Do we know? Well, I mean, I only know what I observed at a distance, you right. know, like I'm not privy to other conversations or whatever. Sure. Tom, Tom was a very, very down to earth, no bullshit kind of guy. He'd always have his little fishing vest on <laughs> at one I'm time. Guy, yeah. Yeah, yeah, very, very down there. I really like Tom. I think he's a good guy. And at one time on the floor of the show, when the show was just starting to pick up this kind of Thursday momentum, uh, we right. had a lot of agents and people's publicists and stuff on the floor while we were shooting the show. And the camera guys, the dolly groups that pushed the cameras couldn't even get to their marks because there'd be some guy with a cell phone out there, you know, or whatever. And I, I do remember Tom doing one of the coolest things I've ever seen. He was just, he was like, get these people off the effing floor. He threw CAA off the floor. <laughs> you, know? you don't see that often. You really don't see that often. He just wanted to get the work done. You know, it's like, you're not supposed to be late. If there's a piece of tape that says A3 on it, there's a reason for that. <laughs> you know, That camera guy's got to get there. He can't get the shot. We can't get the show done. Mm. And you're just standing so i often wondered if that played a part if that because those are powerful people yeah that's uh, it's so interesting we've never been on a set but curious, mm -hmm. we have heard from a lot of the actors from the show is kind of larry david was the boss but it sounds like like i guess there's yes. a chain of command here but it's like sharonis had a lot right. of input and, and power on the set i'm just curious um just, yeah, the dynamic on the set, right? You mentioned Sharon. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah. what's Larry and Jerry doing on a typical, you know, you mentioned they air on a Tuesday, or, sorry, tape on a Tuesday. Like, right. take us through that Tuesday. Like, what's, how long is the day? Mm -hmm. What happens? Like, sure. it, like, I don't picture Larry as like the general running things, but maybe he is. I don't know. Like, you No, he was. He was. He was absolutely, yes. <laughs> Usually in television, because most television shows will have a rotation of directors. So there's like one person that has to like really keep the thing together, keep right. the they show that was like pitched. The Sopranos a lot, like Chase held yes. everything together, but they had a lot of directors on The Sopranos. Exactly, exactly. And that's usually Stifled how it works. Too though, it was like Sharon and Ackerman. That was it. That's I know it didn't wrong. really happen as much in multi camera. It happens in single camera because they need a week to prep, so one person can't do it all. So like one person will be prepping, the other person's filming, and then vice versa. So. But you have this job of showrunner, which was Larry, David, and Jerry. They had pitched the show to NBC. NBC bought the show based on their idea. So directors, usually on TV, are very talented hired hands, as are the actors, you know, because it's, it's their show. You know, you'd see the actors pitch lines sometimes or have an idea, and then you'd see Jerry, nah, nah, you know? <laughs> And it can be frustrating for people because everyone's creative and they have great ideas. But again, this was a different kind of show, you know, a show about nothing. And they didn't want to be like other shows. And if you were to have visited the show, you would have thought that Larry David was the director. Right. You would have absolutely thought that. And I, I remember um, an actor, Rick Overton, actually, who was the Drake. <laughs> And he came over and he asked a question to Tom Sharonis, who was sitting on a director's chair in his cool little fishing vest. And he's like, hey, too big, too, what, you know, what do you think? And he goes, that's a Larry David question. And I, <laughs> okay, that's interesting. Because <laughs> I wouldn't have thought that, you know, but, you know, it's, it's their show. They pitched the show. So, but uh, I think the question that you asked was what, it, what was a typical Tuesday? Uh, Tuesday would on average be like a 12 hour day. We would have had scenes like the exteriors that you would see on New York Street that were pre-shot on Monday. 
sometimes maybe a car scene or something that would be pre-shot. So that would be played back or reenacted for the studio audience. We would come in around 10 or 11 and refresh the show. We re-rehearsed the scenes for the camera guys to make sure that everything was good. Um, there would be a meal break and the audience would load while the meal break was happening. A lot of times there were different lines coming in for people, different dialogue coming in for people while the audience is loading, the show is still being written. And people don't know that, you know, if, if you've ever been to a taping or know anyone that's been to a taping and it seems like the actors, wow, they've been rehearsing all week and they don't know their lines. They might've just got that line. Uh, yeah. Which is really, it's, that's a lot of pressure. You got to really be, you know, because especially I noticed for actors that come from theater who really, really want to be prepared. You, you can't in theater. That doesn't change that play that you saw Larry David. That's, that's a play, you know, you honor that text and, and those lines aren't going to change or you found a funnier joke or whatever. So it's, it's a lot of adjustments. The audience would come in, I think around, I forget if it was six or seven and the filming with the audience would usually take maybe three or four hours. And then the audience would leave. And Jerry did the, the coolest thing. I've been on a lot of multi-camera sitcoms. But at the beginning of the show, the audience would be seated, whether it was season three or season nine. You know, Jerry would run up the little steps to the audience in the bleachers and take the microphone and talk to everybody and do a few minutes of stand-up. Just like in the, oh, wow. like the pilot from season four? Yeah. yeah, but we had a separate set. Yeah. You know, for that, that was far removed. He ran right up. I mean, if you were sitting in the front row, you're like, there's Jerry. <laughs> and this is all the way through, even the later seasons when the show Absolutely. was Absolutely. Yeah. Every single Tuesday he did that. And I thought it was the sweetest thing. And he just welcomed everybody. And thank you guys for coming. And he'd walk them through a little bit. And then we'd have a warm-up comedian also. All these shows have warm-ups. Right. And, and sometimes either a live band or a DJ. And the warm-up comedian would always explain, you know, okay, we pre-shot this scene yesterday. And we're going to play it back to you. And then we're going to show up in the coffee shop. So that you could really follow the storyline so it all made sense. And one of the things that people absolutely loved, and I don't know if people have told you this, but like the car shots that had, they instead of playing it back, sometimes they would like just drive the couch. They would put the couch up or they would take some folding chairs, and people got such a kick out of that because you were seeing something that no one else would see. That's really cool, actually. Yeah, great idea. I like that. People love that. Um, so what what was some of your I mean, you're 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 there for that such a long run. I mean, mm -hmm. what is some of your memories as far as like, you know, um, maybe stuff we didn't see that like you just mentioned. So were there any bloopers mm -hmm. that really stick out to you or something like that or like deleted scenes? Oh, God, there were like, so many where something happened that you're just like, this is incredible. Mm -hmm. I can't remember actually seeing this right now. One of the biggest things that happened is uh, we had, we went in one week for a, a script that Larry Charles wrote called The Outing. And it was very, very different than the show that finally aired. Um, it was a white script. We went in one day and then we, we shut down because it wasn't working. And Seinfeld is one of the few shows that ever, that ever took the time to do this. And it was if they weren't happy with the script, they had scripts, but they would work on it and they would fine tune it and get it to the, the level where Larry and, and Jerry were happy with it, that they would just take a week off. Now, if you're on the crew, <laughs> it kind of screws you up and you're like, I'm budgeted kind of for this or, you know, or maybe you have another show that you're trying to juggle. The camera guys usually had two shows. So it got tricky, but because they did that, because they took the time to really make the show as good as they could, that's why we got nine years. You know, for me, it, it, it made total let them make a good show so we can come back next year, you know? Yeah, and I think that's what, Jerry always talks about, he, he calls the show homemade. So like yes. there's, there's so few people on the show, like you mentioned, and you mentioned Larry Charles and we've had yes. Peter, Mel we've had Peter Melman on. And I think, and you mentioned Sharon is like, yes. like these guys are just like incredible minds. Can you share any, yeah. any insights into like how it was working with, with Melman and Charles specifically? I, I listened a lot. I mean, we were not, privy to the writer's room but I would mm. listen on sets and run throughs a lot of times they would do the network notes and sometimes we were nearby and I would like pretend to be doing something but I'm listening you know because I want to I learn this process and Larry Charles to me god he was 
the most like renegade yeah. type writer. He would come up with with scripts that didn't necessarily to me seem Seinfeldy. Right. Yeah, that's, you know? that's his thing. A lot of his episodes yeah, are exactly. And yeah. then they would, you know, hone it a little bit or work on it. We did one episode, I can't remember what it was, but it was I think it was Larry David and Larry Charles on a boat getting pummeled with water. Yeah, that's in uh, the pilot when uh, Dalrymple wants. Hey, wants yes, to yes. Join Greenpeace. I knew you guys would know. Yeah, Larry David <laughs> and uh, Larry Charles are in uh, the boat for Greenpeace, and Dalrymple. Larry Charles was like he was <laughs> like Russell Crowe and Gladiator with that. Like, Bring it! You love you can see Larry like oh god oh. <laughs> I just thought nothing to me further illustrated the difference between them than that. You know, I mean, you would. Oftentimes we'd get a script and even if you didn't get the cover page to see the writer, you would go, oh, I think this is Carol Leifers or I think this is Peter's. You could hear like a tone or an idea to it. And a lot of times I would go up to the writer on the script cover credited with the script and say, oh, my God, I love this line or whatever. And they go, yeah, that's not mine. They go, <laughs> and you feel bad, you know, like, I'm <laughs> sorry, I thought, you know, but a couple of times I would tell jerry i mean oh this episode's great he says yeah yeah we only did like 30 percent of it and i think oh because it really was a committee right you know interesting um so yeah that, that's kind of covers a lot of the writers and, and directors mm -hmm. what about the actors so i know you know obviously the main four we've talked to a lot of the guest stars you know you yeah. were, and some of the ones you, you were in with um you know the jimmy and um yeah. the parking space one of our favorites uh you have a great line in the face painter. You're the one who, you know, you bring the matzo ball soup to, to George. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> says, I love you. But like, what, what, what was some, I mean, you're, so when you're standing in as Julia, is Jerry balancing those lines off you and, and George, or is it their stand-ins too? Or is it a mix of both? Like how much interaction with the other actors did you have? I mean, you're there for so long. I'm assuming a lot, but yeah. I mean, you could talk to like working with all those guys. Michael sure. Richards it, and it, uh, it depends. It depends on what you're doing. It's a, if you're camera blocking, then it's all four of us stand-ins. Um, if you are filling in for Julia in a run-through because she was on a film or she wasn't feeling well or she wanted to be with her kids, um, then you're working with the other actors. Hmm. And um, we all often, Norm, who stood in for, um, for Kramer, for Michael, we seem to get to rehearse the most because Jerry was always there. He was Right, always, he's always, always going to be there, right? Even if he's not in the scene. He's yeah, even if he wasn't runner. sick, he showed up with laryngitis once when we were doing the maid. The maid. Right? The maid. Yes. Yeah, yeah, we talked. Yeah, I think Angela Angie told Feather. you that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and Deck was off on the side reading the lines, and he, you know, <laughs> so Jerry never really got. I my my friend Deck who stood in for him, he never really got to work with the actors as much as we did, and unlike a lot of shows, these guys were very welcoming to us you know they treated us no differently than they treated each other that's not the same on all shows that i've been on a lot of times they won't even like look you in the eyes you're like dude we're just trying to help you, you know? right. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean. um so it was it was I mean, it was just it was great um one of the one of the things i worked the most on was with michael and the sniffing accountant when he's oh, sitting yeah. at the bar um i had an off camera line but on camera i was the waitress that threw the bar thing over and hit him yeah yeah so we rehearsed it a lot and i so didn't want to hurt him you know we must have rehearsed it six or seven times and you're going harder 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 I'm like <laughs> like i could just, yeah if i hurt you not gonna go well for me you know <laughs> like, right so anyway during the meal break when the audience is loading and they padded the thing up they put a lot of padding, brown padding that would have matched. And then I rehearsed with, with his stand-in, Norm. And I said, can I try this with you? If I hit you like this, does it hurt? You know, and no, no, it's good. So we're there and the audience is there and all that energy is coming at you and stuff. And I did it and I just threw it. He said harder and I threw it. And then we cut and then Michael goes, that really hurt. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. I mean, <laughs> the sniffing accountant, is one of our favorites again that's a season five which right. is just an incredible season so you yeah what were i mean god you were in some great episodes i'm trying i'm looking at it now i'm trying to think i mean even in the parking space wh where'd you grow up peggy i grew up in chicago born and raised oh, okay yeah. well i mean we've yeah mark de carlo oh, pat Phelan, like Finn. there's such yeah. a rich oh pat Finn is such a nice guy oh yeah, god, great. Those guys, so good 
You you Chicagoans, salt of the earth. Let me tell you. <laughs> well, let me tell you. But in the parking space, you just had that like New York, like you know, like yapping with the person next to you about the. Right, right. So funny. Yeah. But what's your what's your favorite episode that you were in? Oh, that I was in. Um, it's different because. You know, you like an episode. Sometimes you see when it finally all comes together. Like, I absolutely love the parking space. I think it was hysterical. Um, not just because I had a line in it, but what happened during the filming, and you, you guys may already know this, but when we were filming outside in this, like, miniature New York street, it got dark. Yeah, yeah, Ma, uh, just, uh, Lee Ironberg just told us that. He yeah, 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 that's he right. He just told us about that. It was a long shoot, right? Exactly, and we're and outside. Then, I, probably well, I thought that was done by the lighting department to make it look like the day was like a long no. day. They were out there. That's so crazy. Point, we're all standing out there, and everybody's thinking, "Well, did we come back tomorrow? What did we do?" And then, it basically Jerry, Larry, and, and the director all decide that it's actually even funnier that these guys are so stubborn that they would stay right. out there all day and all right, night right. and fight. So we just kept going, and I thought that was perfect. That was perfect. So for, I mean, I love the fact that I'm in it and I'm a little small part of it, but, and my friend Deck is also in it as a storekeeper. He was Jerry Stannon, but I love it for that. I love that they, they went with it, you know, cause you don't see that on a lot of shows. Most sitcoms would be, well, we'll have to come back tomorrow and shoot it before the audience, or we'll just show it to them and we'll shoot it next week because that's what we wrote down. <laughs> you know, yeah, like, that is i mean it's crazy because it's one of those things where it worked out perfectly and they went with exactly. it. i love that too yeah and it made it even funnier i mean it really did um the parking or the parking garage had a similar thing which you probably know yeah yeah where the car was the car that wouldn't start. start yeah and yeah. i mean it's even funny it's like this perfect poetic karma ending you know so yeah <laughs> So those are your, that's your favorite because you were in it. You, so I guess you were on the show so early that we, were, we usually ask if you were a fan of the show before you were no. on it. But I mean, the show, you were on season two. Did you come or season three? I guess it was season, season three was season the first three. full so season. Not many people were, I mean, we were fans in season right. two, but I mean, I don't know if you were, right. it was even on your radar. Uh, oh, I watched it. I our watched number, it because... our number one episode of all time is from season two. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, Which yeah, one? Yeah. Can, yeah. Can you guess it, Peggy? Can you guess it? No. No, no, no. Oh, okay. The phone that was the one that impressed me. The phone. Oh, message. okay. Phone oh, I, I mean, yeah. tippy toe, totally tippy toe, that. lemon tree, lemon tree. <laughs> our actually, well, you know what? Our uh, yeah, our number one is from the phone message, and then the next two are from season three. So I mean, we're mm -hmm. that's where we're coming from. The one that I saw because I had gotten off of the show and had to turn it down. You know, I, I decided mm -hmm. to watch it to see what I was missing. I was on a very traditional cop show. You know, it was Hunter, come on. Hunter, I can't Hunter, blame you for that. Exactly, I know. Hunter. McCall, I'm watching, right? Yep, <laughs> I'm watching. Saturday nights at 10 o'clock. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I'm, I, you know, I'm watching Seinfeld and stuff. And I, the first one I saw was a Chinese restaurant. And I thought I'd never seen a show do this, like, in real time. You know, like the whole show was just about waiting for a table. And I thought, oh, this show is too good. It'll never last. <laughs> you know? Who does right, that? Right, right. You know? Yeah, I mean. So, yeah. Go so, you know, a lot of the actors, they say the secondary. I think the beauty of the show was letting the secondary character shine. And I, I think yes. there was such a humility from, okay. even though they're making a, you know, a whole lot of money, but like such humility from Jerry. Uh, Jason, Julia, and Michael. Like, mm -hmm. was that? Did you feel that too? Even as an extra, yes. even someone with small yes. eyes. Yeah. Yes. No. Absolutely. I think you're 100 percent right, and I'm glad that that it shows or that you feel that. Um, they were extremely gracious with even with each other. Like Jerry, in particular, would be. You know, I think this is funnier if Michael says it, or in, uh, you don't always see that because a lot of times number one on the call sheet wants that joke for themselves or whatever it doesn't work like that but he's sitting there with the writer's mind you know thinking no it serves the show better and um the guest actors that came in they really they got to shine those roles were beautifully written you could i mean i would sit there and i would watch people just hit it out of the park as guest stars and they, oh god in two or three years they'll have their own show and without fail they almost all did like brian cranston comes in you're like this guy's right. fantastic you know right. <laughs> and there were yeah, so Anthony many Stark people that came in. That. 
Yeah. You know, um, the trance, and you can just see, like, how's this guy not a huge star yet? And he was just doing uh, signs. Exactly. Over, obviously, became one. But exactly. Um, and I met him, <laughs> excuse me, I met him years later on the CBS Radford lot. He was doing Malcolm in the Middle, and he, he still remembered me. And he said, Hey, Peg, how you doing? And we talked a little bit. And I was like, You know, I knew when I saw you. You know, right. and that was before Breaking Bad, you know? Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. So, so you're, you know, talk a little bit about the show that you, that you created, the Don on the Go, because I'm assuming oh, cool, all thanks. of this, all of this experience you got on the Seinfeld set and all these different facets. I mean, on that show, you created it, you directed it, I believe, right? Yeah. You, yes. you produced it. You're, so yep. that had to be, you know, I can't imagine you doing that without having the experience from Seinfeld. I mean, can you exactly. talk a little bit about how No, it's true. I, I, I was on Seinfeld and Will and Grace for almost 15 years of my life, like a third of my life. and I really learned like the heart of comedy, how you can take unlikable characters and make them likable or make people care what happens to them. And uh, particularly on Will and Grace where you were taking a subject matter that not everyone was open to or cared about. And um, just a brief example of Will and Grace. We were doing the show right after Ellen's show had kind of failed or dropped in the ratings after the coming out episode. So everyone believed that you could not do a, sh a gay show. Right, right. So a lot of our, our crew, I was with Jimmy Burroughs then, and we would go from show to show to show. And, and a few people on the show were concerned that the show would never make it. And they weren't, well, some people weren't particularly thrilled about the subject matter. We had been filming for about a month. We did a Halloween episode where um, they had like, they were dressed as Starsky and Hutch. And Jack met a guy and then they, it, it looked like it was going to work and then it didn't. And some of these very people that were, didn't think the show mattered or whatever were like, aww. <laughs> they were sad that Jack didn't work out with the guy. And I thought, oh my God, they did it. They found a way to do it for people that might not care mm. or might think that this is so different for me, I don't understand it. And all of a sudden they're on his side. Within, a, within four weeks, they did that. And so my goal with my show, because it's about my friends who's handicapped and still dances, was a lot of people don't know people with a disability or anything, and they might not understand it, or they might think, hey, hurry up, get out of my way, or whatever. But if you can find a little heart in that, something to identify with and, and still make it funny, then maybe people will care, even if they don't know they do. So that's the goal. That's a, I mean, that's a great message. I mean, and coming from the, uh, the side belt, you know, the no hugging rule applies. Right, uh, right, right. I know. You know, yeah. Hat, hats off to you. Um, yeah. So did you, I no, just, and more about down on the go, like you, you're obviously like, you mentioned Larry David was like the director, the show. Runner, right, like, right. Everything to that show was, mm -hmm. was he a, you know, more or less a role model for absolutely in some ways, like obviously not personality wise, or, you know, maybe you guys mm -hmm. are, but um, just like structure of a show and how to, and how to run things. You, yeah. You know, I, I admire anyone that has like the courage of their convictions, you know, and however that manifests itself, it plays out. But I mean, there was one time when NBC was doing a block of things. It was a blackout. It was blackout night on NBC, mad about you, single guy, the lights went out. And Larry Dave was like, go around us. <laughs> He's like, don't tell us how to do our show. We got our little show here. Because he had the numbers to back him up. Right. They didn't, you know, we had the lights on that week. And I just thought, but that's a guy who knows his show. So speaking of that, just getting back, I know we, we touched on it earlier. The, you know, Sharonis left, um, right. Larry Charles left. Mel kind of, he popped in a little bit, but for the mm -hmm. most part, he was, after season five, after the Hampton stuff, he kind of laughed. Like, tell us, I mean, I know you're on the show, ratings mm -hmm. are great, probably exciting, but like, did you, did you on set feel a difference? Did it get a little, we always feel like it gets a little cartoonish, which it's funny, you know, on Instagram, Twitter, like, that's what most people actually yeah, we're lean to. Right? I don't know. And, but and love, whether it's yada yada, yeah. super Nazi, mm -hmm. all that kind of thing. But right. when, Right, but when you were on, did, did you feel that too? Or, or what were yes. you a bigger fan of, the early years or the later years? Uh, the early years. Ah, the early yes. Years. <laughs> Absolutely, With, without fail. I mean, and the shift that I think that you're feeling was that you had older writers in the earlier years. 
those guys were, I don't know, late forties, fifties at the time or something. And as the, as the show got more, most of the guys were from Harvard as the show got younger and younger writers and showrunners, you see that shift to what I also agree is cartoonish. And the characters remain the same. So it worked, but, one of my favorite episodes was uh, Jerry going to get the rental car and it's not there. Right. You know, like I know why you have reservations. I don't think you do, you know, and I, that's one of my favorite scenes in the whole run of the show because everyone's been there and you can identify with it. Everybody's lost their car in a parking garage, you know, but when you were throwing like balloons off of of roofs and things and stuff, it's like, well, that uh, who identifies with that now, you know, that's different. That's a different world. Right, yeah, exactly. The Craigie, you're life. speaking our language. Yeah, you're talking about language. I mean, that's <laughs> yeah. what we talked about. Well, yeah, we, I mean, the that's the, um, yeah. yeah. And that's the alternate side episode, which I think we ranked, it's in our top five. And that's what oh, this, yeah. this podcast is named after that, obviously, with <laughs> these pretzels are making me thirsty. Yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think I, a lot it, of To it, me, it was a definite, I think a, lot a of definite shift finding, in, in writing. It, we're finding is, um, it's the demographics too. I mean, a lot of the Twitter, Instagram people I was talking mm-hmm. about we didn't watch the show when it aired. They watched it in the reruns. And I think that makes a huge difference. It's kind of hard to explain, right, right. but I just feel like it does. I mean, if you weren't yeah, watching absolutely. it, you're, you're kind of just picking up from here and there. But um, yeah, I mean, you mentioned right. that the, 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 you know, as we're talking about the later seasons, I also think in the later seasons, the the, the guest stars, who, we we like the one, the one hit guest stars, like an episode, like the Jimmy, you know, or, or things like that. But um, right, right, you know, not right. taking any away. I mean, right. we had him on. We had Peterman on, John O'Hurley. But like, as the Putties and mm-hmm. the Petermans got bigger roles, and they kind of, and, and even Newman became right, right, things like that. Um, as someone who's been on the set for for that mm-hmm. whole run, like we're talking about, was the, um, I don't know, was it was it noticeable that the the, the scripts were leaning more towards that kind of stuff? I guess we kind of just talked about that, but. Um, I don't know if it really. Yeah, to me, absolutely. Yeah. Ab- yeah I mean, absolutely. You know, and I mean, Jerry's talked about this many, many times, but the show started to get criticized more in season nine, you yeah. know, where people that just loved the show were sort of saying the same thing that we're saying. And the ratings were there. I mean, that's oh, absolutely. The too. The he could have easily, they were driving right. Brinks trucks up yeah, to his yeah, house to come yeah. back, <laughs> but he didn't want to. Right. Because he didn't want the show to fall in, in the fall what more. he felt yeah. was I mean, it's hard to do not. And also, they were doing tw- over 20 episodes by yeah. then, too, right? Season two, yes. was there 12 episodes, right? Um, so, season one was just four. Yeah, it was just a they four. They called right? that a season, you <laughs> exactly. know? And uh, season two was 12 or 13, I can't remember. So, I mean, uh, really, one and two combined isn't even a whole season. So, did you, I know you You were on uh, Melman's show that he had. Um, have you? Oh, it's like, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Did you, any, were you? I don't know how it works so much in the business, but are you, you know, keep in touch or see any, anyone else from Seinfeld from time to time or any of the Yeah, shows? absolutely. Oh, yeah? In oh, fact, yeah. I'm probably going to see Peter uh, next Sunday. There's a, a group of us. I don't know if you oh, know Stephanie cool. Kennedy. She was yeah, our- Yeah, we talked to Stephanie Kennedy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. She's a wonder own. woman and she's having a party at her house with the people that are here locally. <laughs> and Peter's supposed to be there. Well, thank you, thank you. Ask her, make sure she shows you this coffee mug, all right? I will, I absolutely will. I'll take a picture. (laughs) Yeah, I see Carol Leifer from time to time. I I used to see her at the TV Academy. I keep in touch with Jason and Julia and uh, my friend Norm and Elza, our boom operator, will be there. Jeff Miller, our camera guy. So it'll be nice to see the people that are still in California anyway, you know? Yeah. No, that that's awesome. It just it seems like such a close knit group, and everyone we talk to, like no one has a bad word to say about anybody, which is yeah. really, which is just rare. Yeah, it's whether it's really Kennedy, rare. yeah, to to someone, mm-hmm. uh, you know, a main actor, it's just uh, the generosity. It seems to be great. Yeah. You mentioned the food. Even Melanie Smith said the food was incredible. So there oh, you the go. The rap parties were the rap parties were really fun. Oh, the rap too. parties were incredible. Oh yeah, tell us yeah. about the season five rap party. It's all we hear about. Five rap party it was the most amazing thing ever. I think. Was that the Griffith? That must yeah, have been Griffith, Griffith Park Observatory. Yeah. That was one of my favorites. Um, it was an orchestra that had played at Julia's wedding. We had like a full blown orchestra, and I mean, I 
personally, I love the like the fancy parties because you're dressed in in jeans and stuff every day, and it's nice to dress up. I enjoy that. We had a party at Santa Monica Pier once, and it's like, look, I can go to the pier. Okay, I have like four dollars. I can go to the pier. I know everyone liked it and had a lot of fun, but it's not that hard to go to the pier. It's impossible for me to get Griffith Observatory closed to the public, right? So I can wander. You know, it's like. That that was an incredible party. That was one of the all time great parties. So Peggy, what are you uh, what are you up to these days? Uh, how you how you keeping? Are you still kind of entrenched in the business? Any new projects you want to? mention? Oh, very much so. Um, well, I'm still working on Don on the Go. Now that the COVID protocols are starting to we're starting to get this under control, I can work up to a season four, which I had been working on, and awesome. I just joined the Alliance of Women Directors. Because I, what I really, what I really want to do is direct. I know it's a cliche, but I've <laughs> I've seen so many good people do it, and it's such a collaborative thing, especially in television. Like you know, the number one focus, obviously, you make it good and stuff, but you got to make your day. And I do see a lot of directors that come more from film, and it's more sort of about their vision, and that's not always what TV is, particularly sitcoms. You know, you got you got to make the day. That's what you know. <laughs> number one make your day so like when a thing like that happens and you're shooting outside like on the parking space mm. when a thing like that happens you wouldn't have made your day you might have picked up a few hours extra here and there but my god you made a classic you know yeah you made our day today Peggy. oh thank you so much you guys are so <laughs> sweet yeah peggy i mean good things happen to good people you're certainly one of them oh. and uh yeah You've had a great career from Hunter, you know, my favorite show to there you go, yeah, yeah. To step it in Seinfeld and kind of m- making a huge impact. Uh, we can't thank you enough for the time. Thank you, Peggy. Oh, thank, thank you, you so guys much. so much. This went so quick. My yeah. gosh. <laughs> hey, <laughs> you guys forever. <laughs> we'll do, let's let's do it again sometime. Cool. I would love to anytime. Awesome. Thanks right. so thank much. You guys thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, we really appreciate. Thanks, it. Thanks guys. Congratulations you. on your show. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Have a good night. Bye.